Hello, and welcome back to Getting to the Top, where I interview transformational leaders about their leadership journey. And today, I have the absolute honor of interviewing Dr. Miriam Abdul Richards. She is an accomplished senior government official and currently holds the Office of Principal Medical Officer Institutions, acting with the Ministry of Health for the Government of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. She's the first government official that I'm having the, the opportunity to interview. And it's really interesting because there is so much that we rely on for government. She is a non-executive director of public sector and private sector entities in the financial services, manufacturing, and health sectors. She also serves as a director of the Heroes Foundation, a unique organization that nurtures youth leadership. And you'll hear from her you know, about all she's doing as an executive board member of the Shelter for Victims of Domestic Violence, she serves as an assistant treasurer of the Arthur Lockjack uh, School of Business Alumni Association. And in May 2022, she was elected as the vice chair of the 75th World Health Assembly of the World Health Organization held in uh, Geneva, Switzerland. In September 2022, she was awarded the Chaconia Medal Gold, Trinidad and Tobago's second highest national award for service in the sphere of leadership in public health and medicine. And I think that this is something that we want to definitely dig into and understand more about. I think 2022 was certainly a very big year for you. Um, in August 2021, she was recognized by the U.S. Secretary of State for her leadership of frontline staff in the COVID-19 pandemic. More recently, in January 2023, Dr. Richards was selected as the Caribbean delegate for 2023 to participate in the International Visitor Leadership Program, the U.S. Department of State's premier professional exchange program for emerging foreign leaders. And she is definitely not only issue one that has had amazing impact throughout her career, but she is also one to watch for future exciting development. And so with that, I invite uh, Dr. Richards to, to share anything else that you'd like to in her introduction. Welcome. Thank you so much, Raquel. And thank you so much for being an inspiration to so many of us um, younger women and other women in the corporate field and in the public sector field and NGOs. I know this is a labor of love for you beyond your role as a climate change champion for the Caribbean especially and globally. And um, I really appreciate this platform because it's allowed me over the last year to connect with other women, to listen to podcasts. Many of them are mentors. And it's been a very diverse group of women, you know, women from many different countries, different sectors. And it allows, there's a level of relatability that allows me to learn lessons from them. And in the same way, I've referred these podcasts and I've put them up on chats for younger women because it's a sort of a safe space to have a conversation with another woman. So thank you so much. And thank you on behalf of all the other women. I think we are about 45 of us. Um, I'll be the 46th one who is participating in this interview. So I guess I'll start with who I am, um, just for an introduction with everyone. And of course, my name is Mary Abdul Richards and I am a proud Caribbean citizen. I'll start by saying that like yourself. I am, I've been very passionate and I am very passionate about connecting people really to achieve a society in which there's equity. And I guess from your development background and the work that you've been doing over the years, you understand the need for equity within a society. We have to remember that in the Caribbean, we are united by our common background and our common cultures. And we may be small, but when we put ourselves together, we are indeed a mighty consortium of persons. And we are all exposed to the same challenges. You have been, as I said, our climate change champion and every one of us in every island has experienced the impact of extreme weather conditions. You know, Trinidad was usually spared, but we saw what happened in November of 2022. We have all experienced the impact of rising food prices. We've all experienced the impact of COVID-19 collectively. And if we are to tackle these challenges. We need to be united. We need to understand this is our space. We need to control it. We need to embrace it. And we do this by our partnerships. And in my role as the principal medical officer, I was really fortunate to have a first-hand 
experience an opportunity to see partnerships in work. I saw partnerships between governments when small Caribbean islands like St. Vincent and the Grenadines, I saw Bermuda, Barbados gave us larger Trinidad vaccines to help our population. I saw when countries like Japan donated, you know, one over 1 million US dollars for equipment. And I saw the partnerships on the ground in Trinidad between the private sector, banking, energy, the NGOs, the chambers that all came together. And really it, it, it contributed to our population. And, and that's how we ensured that everyone received access to vaccines and healthcare. From the private sector side, where I sit as a non-executive director, I saw the private sector leveraging their strengths to assist government and even from the multinational level, other countries in their group. And from the NGO side, you know, on Heroes and as a director in the shelter, I saw the need for equity to design interventions and to provide support to persons who were vulnerable. There were different needs for women who are victims of gender-based violence. And we had to allocate resources in that regard. There were different needs for children who were wards of the state when there are outbreaks in COVID-19. And I saw the value of partnerships when the private sector, when government got together and collaborated to come up with a children's home to protect these children. And, and we really saw you know, the wonder of Trinidadians. So all in all, I would see myself not just as a medical doctor, not just as a director, but as a connector of persons to really enhance the skills, utilize talents from every sector of society. It truly does excite me. And it's, it's an area that I hope to expand and develop and build upon. You know, it's so funny that you, you bring up partnership. It's such an important part of how we, how we ascend and how we work towards our, you know, the realization of our, of our true selves. And I was honored to interview the head of uh, Richard Branson's Virgin Unite Foundation, uh, Jean Alwang, and she recently wrote a book called Partnering. And it talks about that, you know, how, you know, individually there is, there is a lot that we can do, but together in these magnificent partnerships, we can do so much more. But before we get into all of that, I really wanted to, to dig into this uh, Chaconia Medal Gold for, for, for Meritorious Service and Public Health Leadership. I mean, you know, how, how as one of the, the youngest people to get this award and one of the youngest medical doctors and, and youngest women to get this award, how, how did you feel? I mean, how did you find out? Let's start there. Take us through this process a little bit. I found out the Thursday um, before the Independence Awards and I got a call from the office of the president and, you know, I thought it was something work related. And then this lady identifies herself and she says, um, I'm just calling to congratulate you that you've been, you know, given a national award. Um, you know, of course, this needs to be kept in strictest confidence. You need to come on a particular day to collect your invitation and your instructions. And I was, I was actually just finishing um, a feature address with the central bank's regional governors um, and the HR heads. And I was in a car park in lot, so I kind of was reverse. I was reversing my car, and then I stopped and I said, um, "Award, really?" And she said, "Yes, you and the health team." Um, but this needs to be kept confidential, you know, um, until it's released to the media on the particular date. Of course, I'd heard about national awards. You know, I have national awards in my family. Um, I've been to national awards, you know, receptions. So I just was like dumbfounded, and I'm like, "Well." okay, so when is this? Is this, you know, going to be where, you know, I start asking all these questions and she says, no, all I need to tell you is you probably need to be aware of the date. You have two guests. You can tell them because we're going to give them the invitation and this is the dress code. <laughs> I did not want to seem superficial by asking what the dress code was. <laughs> <laughs> and I sat in the car, I mean, I pulled back in the, you know, the spot and I was like, wow. And this immense sense of responsibility just overwhelms me. And I'm on the phone there and I'm thinking, should I ask which award I'm getting? Should I call, you know, the CMO and the health team? Because they say it has to be confidential. Mm -hmm. And then I said, um, can you tell me which award I'm getting? Because I'm thinking in my head, this is a public service merit award or hummingbird goal. And she says, oh, it's a Shikonia medal goal. It's second highest award. 
And I was like, thank you very much. You know, I mean, at that point, I just have to be courteous. Yeah. And I, I left because I had to, to go to a meeting at work. And I think when I got home and I sat down, the realization hit. And I became so aware that this is now a responsibility. It's been a privilege to be an award, but it's now such a responsibility on me as a woman, as a physician, as a government, you know, civil servant, that I need to conduct myself in a manner that yeah. is exemplary. You know, this is now the National Awards Committee. Yeah. This is now, you know, and, you know, I wanted to call people to ask them, well, what is this about? What does this mean for me, my colleagues? But we were bound by confidentiality. So here I so was. Who was, the you first, know, who was the first person you were allowed to tell? Well, I had two persons, two guests. So I had to, mm -hmm. I was allowed to tell them because they, of course, had to prepare new. Of course, I called my mother and she was just silent on the phone. And she was like, she said, you know, you know, that, that's really impressive that they recognize you all. And then she's like, what about the team? So I said, well, they said the team, but I don't know who would have got what because I haven't seen them to ask them. And they said, we are bound by confidentiality. And then I had another mentor and I would say another adopted mother. Mm -hmm. And I called her and she was so happy. She was close to tears. And she said, you know, I can't believe you're taking me with you. So it was those oh. two ladies there, I, have, I mean, I have a lot of mothers. I have another mother who, um, you know, kept, has kept me, you know, very strategic and has taught me a lot of lessons. And I called her because I was, you know, I was thinking, okay, let's see how I could speak to someone and get this. And, and then she told me, she says, I said, oh, are you into the award ceremony? She's like, yeah, you know, I'm looking for a dress now. So I realized that she would be there. Yes. So that was the first call. I, I actually did not call him on the same day. I think I wanted it to sink in and collect the invitation in my hand. <laughs> and then I sent them screenshots and I said, you know, you've been invited to this and call them. Yeah. No, I, I think it must be. And I think maybe when people see the, the awards, you know, and you're always so impressed by the selection and, and, but you don't think about the weight that it is of responsibility because it is, it's a, it's a lifetime award. So you are awarded, people will always look at you as the recipient of this national award and will expect things of you going forward that that was a burden that you may not have had to carry before so how do you deal with that 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 pressure that expectation that 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 sense of of responsibility that's a very interesting question and it's now a continuum from my role in the COVID-19 pandemic because, as I said, it is a privilege, it is an honor, we are all humbled, the entire team, but with it comes this immense sense of responsibility in the way you conduct yourself, in the activities you participate, and it's for the rest of your life. And also the persons who are around you, so there's a level of exposure that's even granted towards your relatives, your significant other, your colleagues, and, and, and others that are close to you. It was actually a process for me because in 2021, I recognized that I was, I became an, you know, an unintentional public figure. And that was during the pandemic when I just saw myself like the rest of the team, the CMO, who is an inspirational leader and one of my mentors, we saw ourselves as doctors. We came and we gave statistics, but then there was, all this commentary about us, positive, negative, social conversations. And for me, I'll have to admit that the most difficult time was between November and January, November of 2021 and January of 2022, when we had the Delta cases and there were a lot of deaths mm -hmm. and cases. And mm -hmm. I was also dealing with a lot of negative publicity um, regarding a board appointment at Angus Tura. And it was the most difficult time of my career. And I really had to develop grit mm -hmm. and that sort of grit, which is, you know, basically having guts and being resilient and being intentional and having tenacity, put me in a place where I had to recognize, here's what, you're an unintentional public figure, but you now need to live with it. Yeah. Okay, Your life is not going to be the same again. So by the time the award came around, um, you know, in September of 2022, I had processed, I had to do immense self-work. I had to understand myself 
and I had to learn you know, regarding my behaviors and my responses to persons. And we all want to show the best versions of ourselves mm -hmm. when we meet people. So in terms of adapting to that responsibility, I had a lot of support along the way. Well, I'll start with the leadership of the chief medical officer. He was always there for us and the camaraderie between our team. He exemplified you know, humility, he exemplified resilience. He protected his team during difficult times. Fantastic. And that camaraderie and leadership was key to now understanding the responsibility of this award. And of course, he is the, you know, the youngest ORTG holder in the history and so well deserving of it. Another factor that helped me along the responsibility line would have been the role of mentors. And I've never had official mentors um, you know, in terms of coaching and developmental areas. But what I've had in the course of you know, my, my career and experience has been exposure to these incredible people, men and women, because I'm, mm -hmm. a lot of men helped me along the way. Yeah, absolutely. And we, don't, we, don't, we don't get to the top without support no, from both men and women. No. It's just because they're the ones who hold the spaces. So we have to, we have to, be, we have to find those allies who are, who are willing yeah. to support women. Yeah. It's been incredible. I mean, just to digress, there were no women in health. There were no women to talk to. So, but there were men and there were men who would basically say, you're doing a good job. This is what you do. It's one day at a time. And then as a mentee, I learned something from a very um, prominent male executive. And he said once to me, when you see somebody doing something good, you must watch and follow them, adopt them as your mentor. Mm -hmm. And with mentorship, it's not about, I would like to be a mentee, tell me what to do. It's about identifying who has the expertise, who is a safe space, who you can vent to. And, and, and another thing I learned that has helped me along the way with respect to responsibility and privilege from Sharon Christopher, who's also um, you know, been a participant on this show and a Shakunia Medal winner, was about focusing, being focused, understanding you know, that people may have commentary about you, but not putting yourself in a situation to have noise around you. So it's been an adjustment to my life it's been a learning experience. Um, you know, I do have to assess situations and evaluate, you know, the benefits versus the risks because you don't want to create noise around yourself. But it also has guided my day-to-day -day life in that I'm very conscious that I need to collaborate with persons. I need to try my best to be kind and to continue helping persons as much as I have because it's indeed a legacy for all of us who've been given these awards. Definitely, definitely, and, and so well-deserved. So tell me a bit about, you talked a little bit about how you, how you managed the, the COVID-19 pandemic and how that thrust you into the public, public sphere and, and you, know, you became a household face and name unintentionally. I think you probably still can't go anywhere without being recognized, even in a mask, because you would show up for the press conferences in a mask and then take it off. But, and, and a little bit about how you coped in terms of developing grit and developing that resilience and, and sort of, you know, avoiding the noise around you to make sure that, that you, you have the stamina to keep going. Um, were there any other coping mechanisms that you used? Yes. The first mechanism and the first understanding, as I indicated earlier, was becoming aware and accepting that I am now a public figure. I am now a public good. And when you're in these positions, not just as a government official or a public servant, but you're, you can be a journalist, you can be a celebrity, you can be a politician, you're a public good. And people do feel, because you are in their living rooms and their homes on a regular basis that they can pass commentary on you. You know, some of it will be positive, some would be constructive, and some may not be that positive. Yeah. But it's about learning to focus. Yeah. Um, the other realities and the other coping mechanisms that I used was really having an understanding that we were not we were not alone in this. Mm -hmm. Every country, every medical team, every public health team in government was facing the same challenge from the very developed countries and high income countries to countries that were lesser developed. So there was that understanding that we were all going through this situation together. At the Ministry of Health, the CMO's leadership, as I would have indicated, was paramount and, and it was key to, to helping us, you know, because he was there for us. Mm -hmm. And it's, an, it's interesting how he was able to have this team that 
was there from the first day. We've we've never. It was a new. It was a team that was that came together, you know, under the honourable minister's um, direction. But the CMO was the technical lead. But he has been able to identify the different personalities and the different talents and the different skill sets and bring us together. And we've got along phenomenally well. Four different personalities, all representing Indigenous talent, Trinidadians, mm -hmm. and so. We were united by a sense of purpose. The CMO said to us, our purpose is to save lives and we will do the, all that we can to save the lives of our people. Whether it was expanding hospitals, whether it was clinical care, getting vaccines in. And as the pandemic progressed and my role became more apparent in building private public partnerships and collab or public private collaborations, the purpose extended you know, within a month or two from saving lives to saving livelihoods. Because of course we were concerned with the economy, of and course. you know my role really was ensuring that the private sector interests through the chambers, through the energy sector, and the financial services sector, those engines kept running uninterrupted. So there was an overwhelming sense of purpose, and we reminded ourselves every day. When things got rough, there were the mentors and there were the supporters, and I would say that. I remember Dr. Hines saying that he would go into Massey in Westmore Rings. And of course, he's very um, he's very prominent with his hairstyle mm -hmm. and his voice <laughs> and his beard, even with a mask on. And people would come up to him in the parking lot and say, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. You know, people would, I, I was in an airport recently and somebody came up to me and said, you know, you're Dr. So-and-so, yes. And they said, you know, a lot of young girls look up to you. Mm -hmm. And it really brings home the point of why you need to conduct yourself in a certain way. But when things got really rough, there were the mentors. I remember a friend of mine telling me, it's a long, hard, dusty road. You're tired, there's no water, but the bus is coming, but you need to be ready to get on that bus. Just be ready, so just stay resilient, stay focused. Then came the impact of community. And even though there were challenges, a coping mechanism was really working with the people doing the work at the shelter, doing the work with, with young children who were, you know, wards of the state and orphans. And it brought a sense of satisfaction to us that we saw the end result of our rule. So there were multiple coping mechanisms. I would say community through helping others, community through the partnerships and the relationships we would have developed, mentorship. I mean, I don't like to use the word male allyship because it kind mm -hmm. of separates men from women. And, you know, the camaraderie of the team, which is, which is incredible. We are friends, we are colleagues, we understand each other, we are there for each other socially, professionally, personally, you know. But it, it, has, it, it has and continues to be quite a challenge, I would say that. Our lives and have been changed, you know, forever. <laughs> yeah, and, and absolutely. But one thing I wanted to, before I segue into you telling me about your sort of career trajectory and how you ended up in this role, I do want to say that um, I remember um, there were reports published about countries that really had done a phenomenal job with COVID-19. And there was consensus in the public domain. It wasn't just that we were in this with others, which we were. We dealt with this extraordinarily well and we had better outcomes and and you know lower incidences of death and so as much as i want to appreciate the fact that yes you know we were in all of this together and and as a, as a country we pulled through i also want to take a moment to just recognize that you guys did really well and we are grateful it's not just you know, the lady in the airport and, and the people in the, in Massey. We, we really appreciate and, and the, we appreciate what we saw. We appreciate the level of communication, but we also appreciate the things that we didn't see when it got really hard in those private moments where you, you must have struggled to wonder if you could keep on being strong and being brave and, you know, supporting us all through this with, with calm confidence that you know that in many, 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 many households, your work was appreciated, yours and the team's, and thank you. Thank you very much. I mean, it has been bittersweet because of course there were families, we all know someone would have passed away from COVID, either indirectly or directly. 
and as physicians who, you know, and our core purpose is about saving lives. It, it, it was hard. It, it, you know, every death touches us, especially our doctors who work at the clinical level. And that's why we're so passionate as a team and as a ministry about encouraging people to, you know, apply the interventions, you know, be it vaccination or social distancing to really reduce the risk of them dying because we are about saving lives. But yes, we did have some difficult nights when the team would be on a call, conference call at 1 a.m. I mean, one of those nights for me was the night when we went down to one ICU bed on December 23rd. The Honorable Prime Minister speaks about it repeatedly. And, you know, having to make that call and to say to our CMO, myself, to the minister, we have one ICU bed. We had nights when the ambulances were being used and, you know, we had a night when 31 people died, you know, in 24 hours. And here's a team just really holding each other together. We've deal, you know, we dealt with, you know, we on the phone and we have doctors crying. And it really took a lot for us because CMO would say one day at a time, let's just work together. And I really, you know, have to recognize the incredible leadership and mentoring that he has really exposed all of us to. Yeah. So tell us about your career. Tell us, how did you start and where did you think you would end up? You know, how, what did you, how did you decide to study medicine? How did this all come about? It's a very interesting question again. And um, I'll use this as an opportunity to remind everyone that I am a specialist medical doctor. I think people at times when they see me, they ask me, are you a doctor? Yes, we're all doctors. We're all specialist medical doctors. We went to medical school. It's just that we have different specialties. I did not think I would be a medical doctor. I had a lot of different career aspirations. I'm actually much more, I would say, gifted and talented on the art side with languages and literature and history and geography. But I'm a proud SAG student, St. Augustine Girls High School student, you know, just as you have the proud bishops, ladies, and convent yeah. ladies. And I did well academically at school. I think I had that talent and that gift, and I'm so appreciative of it, of being a good student and being quite consistent. And Unfortunately, when I was in fifth form, just as I was about to, to, to get my CXE results, my dad passed away suddenly. I was 16. I was the eldest child in the home. I had a 13-year-old sister and a six-year-old brother. And the reality hit that the possibility of going to school abroad um, no longer existed. Now you're into a single-parent home overnight. This is sudden. And, you know, my mom was a school teacher, which was a very, you know, rewarding profession, but not exactly the highest paid and there were priorities. And I took it upon myself at 16 that I would fund my education and I would do the best that I could. And, you know, I applied myself. I got a government scholarship. In those days, it was 50 scholarships. I got a scholarship. And, you know, the advice given to me is, well, try medicine, you know, you'll be independent. So I went to medical school and did, did well again, you know, and um, when I finished medical school, I had to choose a specialty and I was very good in surgery and, and anesthetics and I went to anesthetics and I remember one night thinking, but I can't communicate with people, you know, they're in an, I put people to sleep and I wake them up and then they're in ICU and by the time they start speaking, they leave. And I want, I like people, I like connecting, I like, you know, yeah. building relationships. And I just took the chair in one day. That was, in, you know, inflection point one. I don't want to work in the hospital on these specialties. I want to work with families. Mm -hmm. So I did my um, specialist degree in family medicine. Along that line, I was working in communities like Blanche Shares, Las Cuevas, Brasso Seco, seeing the entire country and thoroughly enjoying it. You know, going to Blanche Shares on a Tuesday morning and driving past Maracas Beach is so therapeutic and collecting fish from the fishing village and building those relationships with families. In fact, I went back to Blanchet's last year after 12 years, you know, and I, I went to the, the health center and they all remembered me. They remember that I adopted mm -hmm. a dog from the street. They just remember <laughs> when I came, but you're part of a community. And as I said, yeah. community means a lot to me. So I was doing family medicine and taking care of families and having a good time, you know, good working hours. But I started realizing that Despite all the interventions we applied, I said people still had high blood pressure. They still had diabetes. And I went to my boss at the time, who became chief medical officer. Again, another incredible mentor, Dr. Kambabach. I said, well, Dr. Kambabach, 
we're doing so much work, but these blood pressures aren't controlled. And he said, young lady, because he was an older guy, you know, young lady, you need to look at policies. And if you want to, he said, right now, you are impacting on the health of a family and a village. But if you want to do it nationally, you need to do public health. Go and look at this school. So here I am just about finishing up this, medi this medical degree, one year break, then doing a specialist degree. So just studying here, I was 29 at the time. And now being told, oh, you need to go and do another master's degree. So I did look up on it, applied for a scholarship, and I was lucky, and I went to London. And my public health degree was one in policy. So it's a little bit different from Dr. Hines and Dr. Parashram, who did epidemiology and infectious disease. So I was fortunate to study in London and in a class with people representing 70 nationalities in my class wow. alone. But I did developmental public health. And it was around policy and financing. And I would have had classes at the London School of Economics and at SOAS. And, 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 and I had a ball in London. I was the class rep, again, connecting people. Mm -hmm. Came back to Trinidad and they assigned me to the ministry. So I shifted from seeing patients in our population-based interventions. And then there's another intervention, another inflection point that happens where we are settling budgets and we ask for a certain amount of money and we get the same amount every year, regardless of what we put. And I recall it was December 2015 and there was a power meeting, but DC was very cold and there was a lot of snowstorms. And the persons who would usually go did not want to go, they did not want to get caught. So the, the invitation comes down a couple levels to me. I say, well, okay, I'll go. Never been to a PAHO meeting abroad. And it was a meeting on, you know, usual diabetes, I thought diabetes, hypertension for the region. But you know, Raquel, when I got there and I sat in that room in snow, it was snowing and um, very cold in DC. And I sat in that room that day. There weren't physicians saying that diabetes or hypertension was important. There were people from the World Economic Forum. There were people from the IDB, from the World Bank. And the conversation was so different to what I heard, which was a conversation around business cases and investment cases and value propositions. And then it struck me, hey, if you want to improve health, you need to understand the language of the people financing it. Because without financing, without relationships, without understanding international relations, you're not going to get the money. Went yeah. back to Trinidad and spoke to a mentor of mine, male mentor again. And he said, yes, you're onto something, but there's something additional you need to learn. You're bright, you're doing well. And I said, what is that? He said, you need to develop your soft skills mm -hmm. because people are core to everything. And he said, here's what, it was the, just before Christmas, it's the Friday before Christmas. Go down to the Arthur Lockjack school, no, no other school, and please ask them to do an EMBA. And I went there and they took me in late. And that has been a game changer for me. Nice. Because I am now a physician when the COVID pandemic hit, who understood business models, who could speak to the private sector, who understood resource mobilization, which is very similar to business development, who could make a business case for a proposal for funding. Yeah. So along the way, you know, the inflection points of having a personal tragedy direct your career in a certain way. Um, because you know, you're on a scholarship and you look at what you could get best value for. And then the inflection point of realizing I like people. I care about people. I want to move now from a people-centered approach to a population-centered approach and then a regional approach. And then understanding the skill set, the diversity of skills required from a business perspective has really helped me along the way. I love that. I, I think so much, so much good stuff here. I mean, I think that your ongoing investment in education made a big difference and helped you to be able to pivot from role to role, even when you thought, okay, well, you know, I, not, not, not a anesthesiologist, not, and then not a family practice, then working with communities, then looking at public health, and then looking at, at the, the business side of it and figuring out how we get it all funded but also the sort of the value in having all of these perspectives together and what that, how comprehensively that impacted your perspective, because you could then see things from a number of different points of view. You can see it from the community because you'd work there. You could see it from the medical practitioner because you were one, but you could also see it from the business perspective because you have that, that, that training and that exposure. And all of that together is, is, is almost a 360 view of the experience yeah. that we would have. You were the person for this moment. 
yes, it's been a continuum. It's been a logical transition from one step to the other based on my experiences and based on my exposure. And I'm really, I've been very fortunate to have mentors along the way and to be exposed to persons to really have that different perspective. Um, I would have had a lot of exposure and certification in international relations, diplomacy, and state protocol um, from my family. And in that way, I was very comfortable in understanding diplomatic relations, which of course form a core part of resource mobilization. So it was an interesting package for someone who would have been you know, right under the CMO and really handing the business side in developing the parallel healthcare system. And I'm very, very grateful to those mentors in the private sector and in this you know, NGO sector who would have really been there to demonstrate that value in building these partnerships and collaborative relationships where we all leverage at our strengths, where we mitigated risks. You know, we, the persons who could adapt to that risk handled it. And we all came together. And that, I believe the culmination of all of these experiences and training led to my role as the principal medical officer and to support the CMO and the government in managing the COVID-19 pandemic. And you know, it's so fabulous that, you know, you were willing to put your hand up and that provided you with so much exposure. And I love the, the sort of framing around mentorship. It wasn't that you went to somebody as an empty vessel and said, mentor me, when you had a specific requirement, request, concern, question, need to pivot, you, you sought out mentors who could, as, as the, the advice that you got, you know, if you see somebody doing something good, follow them and, and, and do that because then you understand, listen, this is, this is what and who I need in this moment. Let me have that conversation. And it isn't about, okay, well, I pick a mentor and that's the one mentor. It is about figuring out what you need in that moment and figuring out who's the person who can help to guide you. Yes, and in a way, possibly it was an opportunity for me to understand what a mentor really was because I did not have formal mentoring, you know, as persons would have in certain organizations. We were not exposed to that. So I had to find my way around what a mentor was and understand what they did. And I found that there were different people that did different mentoring. I mean, I had what is called, I would say, there's the reverse mentor where you have a younger person who mm -hmm. looks up to you and you're able to kind of hone in your skills. And that's a form of mentoring that helps you remind yourself where you need to develop and where you need to grow. Then there's like the anchor mentor, you know, so the women that I would have spoken to you about who would have come to the award ceremony when things were bad, you know, personally, professionally, socially, I would call them. And, and believe me, they would not hesitate to set me straight. Mm -hmm. Right. And say, okay, no, okay, we're done with this. You know, they were a safe space event. Then there were the subject matter experts, men, mentors, you know, um, this is what is happening here, you know, from a business perspective, how should I approach this? So it's about honing in the safe spaces and the expertise in a mentor. And, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll go and extend to say that a good mentor allows you to solve the problems yourself. They allow you to identify the problem, come with a proposed solution, and they will set you straight. They don't give you the direct answer. Yeah. But I'm because a lot of I'm times you know what you think, huh? and a lot of times it is just for you to uncover that. And you don't, well, and certainly for me, I don't tend to, to believe any advice unless, you know, it, it has somehow taken hold of me in, internally. So I think that's really important as well. A good mentor helps you to uncover your own solution because then you're developing a skill. Yes, yes. Definitely. So I am a firm believer in mentorship. I believe it is all, all of our responsibilities to mentor. I know that some persons may not think they have the capacity to mentor. They probably would say, but you know, I, I don't have these qualifications. I'm not a you know, leader in terms of an executive role. But every one of us has the capacity and the ability to influence change and to lead, even in a small way. What we may think, it can be by giving an opinion. It can be giving a perspective that will help us guide a policy that is being developed or an intervention that is national. So we owe it to our colleagues. We owe it to the generation that comes after us to be mentors. And it doesn't have to be that formal mentor or coach or, or any of or sponsor or any of those others. We have to champion change 
And we do this by being exemplary and sharing our gifts and our talents and our experience and perspectives. And then we allow that generation that is coming after us to really have their own self-discovery phase and make their decisions in a much safer environment and enabling environment. And with that, I would like to thank you so much for sharing all of this with us. I learned so much and I love the idea of this, this sort of fluid mentor for the moment, but also looking at figuring out where you are and how each door you open opens up a wider perspective that then you you know you keep developing and growing and being willing to put your hand up and then you know filling out your skill set so that you have such a a breadth of of a perspective that you can look at things from a number of different points of view and be able to take really great quality decisions in that space because you have spent time and you've held space and you've developed your your you know your personal skills to that point that you have those those uh, multiple perspectives. So thank you, Shikonia Medal Gold winner and a national icon. And you know I I'm so delighted that you made the time to have this conversation with us. And I I know that it will mean a lot to a lot of young women. Who, who have seen you in the public space and would be delighted to hear from you about their own sort of career development and the things that they can learn and how they can develop themselves into the best version of themselves and the leaders that they were all meant to be. I really thank you for being an inspiration and thank you for spending this time with me. And thank you for, for watching this episode and thank you. Uh, if you haven't already subscribed, please subscribe and you can find us where you find all podcasts. And I hope that you keep spending and this time with us and being on this journey with us. Thank you. Thank you very much.